Good afternoon. My name is Sei Piao, and I am part of the environmental science team based in um, Malaysia, in Asia Pacific. Innovation has always been part of our fundamental DNA in bio, and we will continue to evolve with the changing times and develop solutions for the industry to give you the products that you need. Today, we will be sharing with you our innovation journey from developing molecules and technologies to going beyond the chemicals into innovative solutions that have the potential to revolutionize pest, the way we manage pests. So, the earliest documented pest control activity was in 20, 2500 BC, where the ancient Sumerians used sulfur compounds to kill insects. And then around 300 BC, the Chinese discovered the ingenious way of using natural enemies to ward off insects. And in the 1600s, biological extracts were used Tobacco infusions using herbs, nicotine, and arsenic were one of the raw materials used for um, pesticides in developing pesticides. And only in the 1800s, pyrethrin and rotenone were specifically developed to be used as pest control. And it was also the same era that um, equipments for application insecticides were developed. That was a boom during that time. So the synthetic pesticide era only began towards the end of the 30s, where DDT was developed and found. Uh, does anyone of you here know the full names of DDT? Can I see some hands, maybe? OK, we, we sort of know how old you are. <laughs> And, and the, the discovery of DDT really triggered an array of development into synthetic pesticides that were very uh, easily available, they were inexpensive and highly effective. And that also led to the discovery of modern pesticides in chlorinated hydrocarbons and other organophosphates. But in an industry-wide monumental shift happened around 1962 with the publication of Rachel Carson's Southern Spring because it touched upon the environmental impact of indiscriminate use of pesticides in our industry. And that actually led to policy changes in the 70s and also deep research into integrated pest management. And integrated pest management remains today a key initiative how we manage pests, um, be it in the agricultural environment, in um, professional pest management, as well as how we manage mosquito-borne diseases. So, what does the history of pest control tell us as an industry? Now, you've seen at the beginning of the presentation that we are on the brink of the fourth industrial revolution. So, what does it mean for us as an industry? Are we, this is, this is where we have to ask ourselves, are we ready, are we prepared to keep up with the changing times that are so volatile? So, one of the things that makes our competitors, if we will, um, enviable of our pipeline is that we have almost too many products. And why is it such an enviable pipeline? It's because of our commitment to long-term research and development. In 2016 alone, we as a company spent 4.4 billion euros in R&D, and that's like more than 12, 10% of our total sales in 2016. And um, we remain committed to developing and discovering new molecules and technologies, but also beyond the chemistry. And, and that could have the potential to revolutionize the industry. So why the sustainable 
developing important to us because we believe that today, maintaining the status quo of professional pest management is not an option. And we need to further innovate to be relevant in the industry. So, in terms of R&D in bio, our key focus really is to um, improve on our portfolio, our range, and also the formulation. So, for us, the key focus will be in the active ingredient as well as the formulation. Now, let us take a look at how um, discovering, discovering a new active ingredient is in general in the company. Now, discovering a new active ingredient is really difficult. It's very lengthy, very expensive, and time consuming. Every year, millions of molecules are screened, but only a handful will make it to the public and, and become a product that you guys use in the market. And on average, it takes about 10 to 14 years and $250 million US dollars for a new active ingredient and a new product. Now, I'll repeat that. It takes 10 to 14 years and 250 million US dollars to develop a new actual ingredient and a new product. I'll let you digest that information before I ask you the next question. How many companies out there you know are still investing in research and development of new actors? Keep that figure in your mind. So, Say a few years later, imagine a scenario where you face resistance to certain products that you're using. You come to us and ask us if we have a new mode of action for chemicals. We'll say, of course we do. We have always been innovating and researching for new products, right? For the industry. But this is where we need your support. Because without your support, we will not be able to, to plow back our revenues into research and development in finding new molecules. Because if you have products that are resistant in the market and companies like us are not investing anymore, what will the industry look like? What solutions do you have in the future? In terms of formulation development, it is also very complicated and involves a lot of studies. And this part of the process of product development is actually the most expensive because we need to generate study reports of up to 120 different types from formulation, stability, toxicity, environmental impact, all this sort of stuff to, to register a certain product. Because we will not register a product that has um, harmful effects to the environment. Right? So, and then there is also the art of balancing different factors of the formulation, like um, say the efficacy, the cost, the packaging, the ease of use. And all these different factors come to play where we develop a product. And this is where it gets really difficult because, um, again, I ask you, how many new product launches out there in the last couple of years that were not new to products? So, so this, this is where we're going to need your support. Okay? Having said that, we and Bio are extremely proud that in the last 50 years, we have been consistent, we have been efficient in launching new products every few years. And these are just some of the key products that we've launched. Right? It's not exhaustive, um, there are still more products on the list. But among these products, there were many firsts. We were the first to launch a space gray product with vapor retardation technology in our forest. And then someone else followed. We were the first to launch monoclonal turbidicides. First with premise, and then with the agenda in Asia. Of course, someone else followed. And we even temporary, we were the first to launch a dual AI residual spray superior for vapor control. Okay. And most recently, we launched Kaotian Polyzone, a residual spray for targeted outdoor um, spray for dengue management. This product was actually developed, co-developed with the Ministry of Health of Malaysia. And it was the first ever product that has this 
property that we could apply to outdoor for us just for funding and management. So, what does that mean? What are, what are the disruptions that are causing these changes in the industry? How are we reacting to those changes? Now, according to the Global McKinsey Institute report published in 2015, there are four major global disruptions that play urbanization, aging population, accelerating technological change, as well as global connections, greater global connections. Now, the first disruption is urbanization. 65 city populations are growing by 65 million people annually. And because of this, cons annual consumption is increasing by 150% every year, from $12 trillion in 2010 to $30 trillion in 2030. And by 2025, it is expected that 2.5 million people of the urban population will live in Asian cities. And that's one of the cities that all of us come from. In Asia. And what does that mean for the economy, for the business, business owners, and investment operators? One very good example of urbanization, very recently, I'm not sure, uh, does everyone here know who Alibaba is? Right? It's the equivalent of um, Amazon in Asia. They had this singles day, which is 11th of November, and it's basically a cyber shopping day. So, because of urbanization in China, people would go to the cities to work and they were lonely. So, this is a day to sort of commemorate their single them. So, because they don't have a partner to spend the time with, they, they go online shop, right? And they offer ma major discounts. So, this year, 11th of November, was a record breaking year for Alibaba. And that one single, year, single day, can you guess how much they made? $25 billion. That is more than Cyber Monday and Black Friday in the US for my friends from America. Come by. Okay, that's the one thing. Like, imagine how much, how many lifetimes we have to work to get that much amount of money. So that is one of the things that we may want to focus on. An aging population. The percentage of people that are growing old is increasing. People are living longer. Um, life expectancy is increasing. 1950, we live until I mean, the global um, average life expectancy was 49 years old. Today, it's 70. And in the next 10 years, maybe 80. Which means all of us have to work until we 60 or 70 years old, right? <laughs> so, so, how is that going to change the facade of the economy? There is a great workforce, so and fertility is, is, is decreasing. So, and the stress and pressure to to provide healthcare to these rural people is increasing, and that's just some of the factors that are affecting productivity worldwide. So, how do we address that? The third is the acceleration of technological change. 20 years ago, 3% of the world's population had a mobile phone. Only 3%. Today, two-thirds of the world's population has one. And annually, every day, one-third of the population is communicating on the internet. So how connected are we right now? Very connected, right? And there is an accelerated adoption of new technologies as well. So one example is when television was introduced, it took them 14 years to get 50 million users. Can you guess how much, face, how much time Facebook took to get the same amount of, of users? Any idea? It took them just one year. Twitter, 0 0.5 seven years. So how, how quickly is, is technology being, being accepted? Right? And how often do we share our cell phones on, on, on the internet, right? So, yeah. And the final disruption is greater global connections. Now, the world is connected in ways that um, it's so connected that it is affecting everything that we do that we previously thought unimaginable. For example, the, the 
um, the symbols there, the Alibaba symbols. You can buy things from Alibaba, from Malaysia, from Singapore, from everywhere in the world. That helps Alibaba generate that revenue. And there is also a greater flow of traffic, be it human, um, finance, trade, people. People are so easily just taking flight to anywhere in the world because it's so affordable. And there is an increase in, in terms of the data flow of, of online traffic because there's been 500 times increase in the last 12 years. So what does all this data and analytics mean for the industry? And how is this disruption impacting the innovation that we have in Bio? We've been talking to many of you, and some of the grievances, if you will, are that we need more training, or we need to equip our pest control technicians better so that they, they know what they're doing. So in 2014, we launched Bio Learning Lab, a comprehensive online learning tool to equip your technicians with the skills, knowledge, <coughs> and techniques to succeed in the industry. And in 2015, we expanded it into Mosquito Learning Lab. And this is a, a awareness-raising uh, platform because we feel that the community has a role to play in mosquito <coughs> control and vector borne diseases, right? And then, this year, we launched Mosquito Press, which is a 3D virtual reality experience to test the user's skills in finding or locating where the potential mosquito brain sites are. And these platforms are available at our booth, so you come and try it out if you have not done so already. And the reason why we are building this violin app, what are you guys doing? Right? Some people are questioning that. What are you doing? Why are you not selling chemicals? So we really want to increase the professionalism amongst the pest control technicians in the industry. Now think about it. business owners. Who spends the most amount of time with your customers? Your technicians, right? When it, when it comes to your customers' place. And if that, that customer has Googled all this information and really ready to ask that person questions, and your technicians are not able to answer these questions professionally, what would that message be to the customers? And what would the word of mouth for that customer be for the next potential customers? Now, imagine the reverse. If this person has gone through all the modules in environment lab and has all the information he needs to answer all these questions, if I'm a customer, I would be really, really impressed with this technician because he has all the answers to my questions. And what sort of brand, they, they, your technicians are really your brand ambassador. So, so that is one of the reasons why we, uh, we develop BioLearn Lab. And then both Mosquito Crest and Mosquito Learn Lab are really to create awareness among the community, the public. Well, we've been talking to the Ministry of Health of, of all the countries in Asia Pacific and also practical program, practical program managers. And almost every one of them have the same complaint. Ah, oh, I've done everything I can. I've, I've done the thermal forming, I've done the ELD, I've done the last assignment. But I still have many cases, and my boss is actually you know, bringing down my neck. And most of the time, the problem comes in where the public is actually having brain size in the homes, and they're not doing their part. So, so this is where we come in as our responsibility in the company to create awareness amongst the public and help the Ministry of Health give that message to the public and say that, look, factor control is not just the responsibility of the Ministry of Health. Every one of us has the responsibility as well. We acknowledge that times are changing. It's changing so fast that nobody knows what's going to happen next year. So we continue to commit ourselves to develop new solutions for the industry. We are prepared to seize the opportunities that this era brings. 
And we will be continuing to bring you solutions that will help you face the future. We are committed to this. Don't worry, we're not just going all digital, we're still having our um, traditional portfolio. So, lastly, before I close, I will ask you this question. This is the question. Are we ready to change the way we manage risks? Because we are. Our team here from Asia Pacific is, is at the booth, so if you have any queries, please come and talk to us. I highly encourage this, this flow of information so that we know what our role needs and we could work towards that. And now, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, safe evening.